Joining us now, we have senior writer for The Dispatch, David Drucker, special correspondent at Vanity Fair and host of the Fast Politics podcast, Molly Jung Fast, and the co-founder and CEO of All In Together and host of Majority Rules on Two Way, and most importantly, celebrating her birthday today, Aww, Lauren Leader. Thank, thank you. you all for being here. So Lauren has a birthday <laughs> gift to you. You get first. Um, let's get your response. Uh, first of all, let's start with, with Trump's comments there about, about Jewish Americans and about how they would shoulder a lion's share of the blame were he to lose. I mean, that is such dangerous dangerous rhetoric. I mean, really, only Trump can show up to a speech about anti-Semitism and immediately repeat a disgusting anti-Semitic trope, which is blame the Jews for whatever outcome you don't like that doesn't align with what I want. I mean, it's just, it's, he can't help himself. And look, I mean, I think Republicans, Trump has attracted a certain segment of certainly conservative Jews who see him as tougher, on Hamas and have been frustrated by some of the dissent in the Democratic Party over uh, over Israel policy. And it's definitely been a winner for him. But, you know, it's just so he's done this over and over again. I'm old enough to remember in 2016 when their campaign sent out one of the most anti-Semitic flyers I've ever seen with, you know, stars of David and dollar bills on Hillary Clinton's face. I mean, they have a long history of this embracing white supremacy and, of course, his own, you know, relationship with avowed white supremacist anti-Semites. So, you know, the lunches and dinners he's had at Mar-a-Lago with some of the most virulent anti-Semites. So it's just it's par for the course. I shake my head. It's just what can you say? It's like he does this over and over again. In the defense of those uh, chanting anti-Semitic uh, things in Charlottesville as, as well back exactly. in 2017. So, Molly, on this topic, it's not, as Lauren just laid out for us, uh, Trump said all these things yesterday and added that he said it was up to Israel, Israel, to defeat Kamala Harris. I mean, it's this is, again, an anti-Semitic trope, the idea that if you're Jewish, you're somehow connected to Israel. And, and look, Israel is an important part of a lot of Jews' lives, but it also is not. You know, you can be uh, the idea that you have to be a certain kind of Jew in order to be Jewish is really quite anti-Semitic, and it is what Donald Trump does. And by the way, conservatives have been doing this forever, right, yeah. saying that if you are, you know, Jews have like a law. I mean, I'm Jewish. My grandparents were fighting for civil rights in the South. Like there is a long history of liberal Jews yeah. and of the connection between being an oppressed people, you know, joining an oppressed people. And it's some of the like parts of my family history that I am the most proud of mm -hmm. is these kind of, you know, fights for equality. So with the idea that somehow that we, you know, that Jews should throw all of this away in order to support a country which is a wonderful country, but is quite far away and is also not what is happening right now. Right now, this is an election that is about America. So yes, it's the dual loyalty. Exactly right. In addition to all of that, at that very same event last night, Trump also said that he would reinstate a travel ban if he returns to the White House. Let's take a listen as to why he thinks that's necessary. We will seal our border and bring back the travel ban. Remember the famous travel ban? We didn't take people from certain areas of the world because I didn't want to have people ripping down and burning our shopping centers and killing people. But we're not taking them from infested countries. Infested countries. Molly, your latest piece has this headline, Donald Trump's Springfield scapegoat, in which you write, in part, Donald Trump doesn't so much run for something as he runs against somebody. His latest attacks are aimed at Haitian immigrants. But what we're seeing is a playbook previously used to target other ethnic or religious groups and with a similar goal, to make the MAGA base feel like they're under attack. Trump needs his people to think America is on the brink of collapse and to associate that collapse with an other. The goal is to panic the base and since there isn't a scary enough truth, lies will do. Trump's lie about Springfield might be particularly grotesque, but it's in the same tradition of racist rhetoric that he has been testing out since the beginning of his campaign and used again last night, Molly, I'll add, with the infested uh, countries line. Um, just talk to us about, I mean, because there's, there's real world ramifications about this. Oh, this yeah. isn't just political scoring political points. This has put people's lives in danger. We have seen what's happened in Springfield where there have been bomb threats, 
hospitals, city hall, and schools closed. Yeah, no, I mean, this is real. And look, he said it about Mexicans in 2016. You'll remember. He said, you know, he said racist lies about Obama. He said, you know, Muslims. He said it about um, Haitians now. And again, it is really just this othering, right? It's saying these lies about a group of people in order to get the base to feel they're besieged or that they're in danger. And then they'll maybe sign on to some of this really extreme legislation, right? Because if you look at Project 2025, a lot of that stuff is pretty off the, you know, it's not anything that we're used to in America. And so the idea here is to do this, is to make his base terrified and to make them think that somehow you won't have a country anymore. And, um, you know, it doesn't, it, it's irrelevant. I mean, I feel so bad for these Haitian immigrants who are just working in Springfield, Ohio, right? Like the way my, Legally. right, the way my great grandparents came here. Like this is yeah. what America is about. And uh, they are now can't go to school. They're scared to send their kids to school. Edwige Danticott wrote a really brilliant uh, op-ed in the Washington Post about how when she came, she's a Haitian immigrant, mm -hmm. 20 years ago, she had the same kind of thing. And we're better than this as a country. So, David Drucker, this is Trump making a base play, and it's one that the Harris campaign is painting as extreme. The rhetoric, Project 2025, all of that. And you've got reporting on how the Harris team is really targeting independents and even some disaffected Republicans in battleground states, namely Arizona. Yeah, there's a whole micro campaign within the Harris campaign that is strictly focused on Republicans and conservative leaning independents who don't like Donald Trump but are wary of supporting a Democrat for president because they haven't become more liberal during the Trump years. They're still sort of traditional Reagan era conservatives. And so what the Harris campaign has done, number one, is, is put together um, a whole group of validators, Republicans that have endorsed Harris because they find Trump um, unpalatable for, you know, a lot of the reasons we discuss on a daily basis and sent them into these battleground states. And in Arizona in particular, um, they're sending them into deep red counties, not just throughout suburban Phoenix. And, you know, we know that during the Trump era, uh, suburban voters have drifted from the Republican Party. Um, they've been supporting Democrats, but they, they've got people uh, throughout the state. There are dedicated ads. There is a lot of phone banking and door knocking. And this is a very, again, like sort of micro targeting uh, type of, of operation. And, and one thing I'll, I'll just say here is it's interesting what they're saying in order to try and move the needle here. What they're telling these voters is we're not here to ask you to re-register as Democrats or to become Democrats. What we're asking you to do is give the Republican Party some space to get back to what it used to be. Now, we, you know, we can debate whether that's possible, but what they're saying is uh, we don't find Trump uh, worthy of our vote. We're hoping to get past the Trump era to a point where we can start to vote for Republicans again, where you can start to vote for Republicans again. But for now, part of doing that involves supporting the vice president. And in Arizona, they invoke John McCain's name, which I'm told still has a lot of currency. And sort of related to that, Kerry Lake gives them a way of pointing in a very direct way uh, to how Trump has impacted the party.